This is the UK Brand Show with Penny Williams and Mark Chaloner. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Hi, Pen. Hi, Mark. How you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Very good indeed. In fact, um, we're both buzzing, I think, because we've just yeah. finished the interview with our special guest, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, I think I, I, I hope I don't embarrass him too much, but I think it's one of our, our best guests we've had on. Um, I, I think he's, uh, yeah, the, the, the history of, you know, crossing from uh, journalism broadcast into back into print again. And uh, yeah. Very, well, very interesting. Don't know, our, our, our guest today was Mark Thompson. And if you don't know who Mark Thompson is, shame on you. But if you don't know, he was a former director general of the BBC, he introduced the iPlayer to the world. Um, his illustrious career goes back to, well, at the BBC from 2004 to 2012. He was, um, he was part of the team that created Watchdog, Breakfast Time TV, he was editor of the Nine O'Clock News, Panorama, controller BBC, director television, and eventually Real, the general. I mean, it's an amazing trailblazer, wasn't he? You know, you just, just you, you walk through the career and some of the, the conversations we've had with him, and yeah. um, you forget those pin, you know, those um, pivotal points in media. Nineteen eighty nine, he, he talked about. So yeah. um, yes, fantastic uh, interview. I'm sure. And he sure was then going to be, uh, of course, CEO and president of the New York Times Company. And because the New York Times are, is, well, is the one newspaper in the world that say that people just look up to this day. And he, he's, done a, yeah. five, he's done an amazing job there. Five million people now subscribe to mm. the New York Times. That's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely and introduce the paywall. Introduce the paywall. Done a huge success there. He's now. Uh, gone on and he's consulting with Axel Springer, one of the biggest media companies in Europe, and he's chairman of the mm. board of directors of Ancestry. Um, yep. So it's an amazing... A busy man. Yeah. So uh, we, we interviewed him earlier. Um, if we yep. are on different time zones because he's out in New York. So we did the interview a little earlier today. Um, and then we, we've got this to show you now. So do stay with us because he, he talked about digital transformation. He talked about... Uh, culture change and all sorts of different things and uh, we're going to join the interview uh, where we're asking him about the the need for internet and investing in journalism and um, we talk particularly about um, what his views were in terms of changing the landscape so here we go with that this is a transitional period where a lot of things which have been kind of held either overtly or covertly to be true or valid are being abandoned by us all really. And we don't quite know how to do that. And we can't do it in a kind of nice, easy way. I mean, which is why always these, these reports like the recent report in the UK, I mean, it's very hard to capture this stuff in like one report and say, this is where we are. Racism is not itself a problem anymore. It's a, in my view, a really foolish thing to kind of, you know, that, talk about leading with your chin. I mean, it's, it's uh, and by the way, it simply doesn't accord with my own experience of, 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 of British institutions. I think these are real issues. And, you know, if, if you say to me that some aspects of um, exclusion and prejudice have changed, and it may be some of them have got better, and that may be true, I think there are profound problems still. I think we have to work through them. And I just think we all need to be, um, you know, to have the humility to listen and respond, and not, ex not expect to move from this state to that better state in a way which is pain free, it just won't be. It's gonna be very bumpy, I think, and it already is. Um, I said when I left the Times that I thought that my period of the Times, you know, the chapter of the book sort of thing would be, you know, digital survival. How can we make sense of digital? Kind of that's 2012, 2020 sort of thing. The next chapter I think is called Culture Wars, which is what do we stand for? How do we work through all these issues? And, you know, and my, I've, I've got a lot of faith in my successes at the NYT that they will work their way through it, but it's not easy. And, and feeding into that, Mark, you said recently that news outlets need to truly embrace the internet and invest in journalism and they want to survive. Yeah. You know, yeah. And does that same philosophy, uh, philosophy of, of investing in digital apply to all companies, big and small today, do you think? I mean, do you, what would you say to I, anyone I, watching I, or listening? And then I do, I do. The SMEs, I, I'm thinking. Uh, so, so the way the way I, I think about that, and I might briefly go back to diversity. So the way I think about that is is um, how do you engage people? 
Now, that, this is how do you engage people with news? But it's also, if you are a retailer, how do you engage shoppers? Um, I've become chairman of Ancestry, and that's a, a family history. Um, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you become a subscriber to Ancestry, you can, you know, they've got immense numbers of, of records around the world, gene genealogical records, birth, marriages, and deaths, and much, much more you get to, and the, and the uh, app helps you find your own story, your own your family story through these records. That's engaging people and bringing useful information and useful functionality together with audiences. Now, there are, you could say, well, you know, a car isn't, you know, car's not like that. A car is a physical piece of technology, which is gonna, you're gonna drive from A to B. That's, surely that's not digital. Turns out, actually, it is that the, yeah. the, the car itself is a mobile digital platform. And by the way, the actual way the car runs, you know, um, um, is going to be digital. And, you know, honestly, you won't need gearboxes anymore. Mm -hmm. And not needing gearboxes means you don't need the engineers who design gearboxes and, and make gearboxes and repair gear for gearboxes. That's, that will go in a way that, you know, the people who provide the straw for the horses, it's like, you know, the horse goes, you go, or at least your livelihood goes. So everywhere I think it's happening. And, you know, it, it is, I think essentially, I, I don't believe by the way that digital is wildly different from pre-digital in terms of the way business works. What I do think is it's an unstoppable change, unstoppable. And you either basically, you know, you can, you can kind of get into the cab of the steam roller or you can stand in front of it. And I prefer the first to the second. Now, the interesting thing is, I believe the same about diversity as well. So if we forget social justice for a moment and just think about what makes business sense, you can feel, for example, in the, in, in the United States, very, very big companies who bluntly, you know, they only do these things kind of, you know, when their push comes to shove, but I think of, you know, for example, um, uh, uh, the Coca-Cola company and the very big airline Delta, these guys no longer feel they can stand, stand on the sidelines on these issues. And you'll know that very recently, um, there's been a move to pass legislation in the state of Georgia in America, which many yeah. people think is gonna significantly restrict voting. You, by the way, most British people don't know, um, and people outside America quite what this is like. My daughter, who's mid twenties, has got a very close friend who is an elite student, you know, um, Harvard, she's now doing a PhD in sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. And, and, and this young woman is a really quite exceptional, I mean, she came from a very, you know, plain background, school had never got um, any student ever into any elite universities. And this young woman and her sister are, um, are, are going to take the world by storm I and mean, they're incredible people. You know, she twice in 16 and 18 essentially couldn't vote because she lives in Georgia and her name uh, is a name which um, clerks uh, can, can recognize as African-American. And she was told twice that her signature didn't match the signature they had on record. Hmm. And there's essentially, the theoretically there's an appeal, but by the time the appeals happen, you've missed the election. So, and of course, it's no surprise to her. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. And that stuff is, is if anything at the moment, getting worse, not better. But big corporate America is standing up to some degree, not enough, yeah. only when they're yeah. pushed, blah, blah, blah. But to some degree, stand, what, why are they doing that? Well, maybe that made me partly because they, they have got moral views about this. I want to say, if you stand with, with uh, the future, if you want to attract young audiences, including, by the way, white young audiences and urban audiences, you better show you get this stuff. People yeah. under the age of 30 or 35 or whatever, 40, it's like, it's not... You know, it's not liberal to believe in fairness. It's like what they all do is they, they live in that world and then through their education, they will have had it drummed into them. They'll have, they'll have had that drummed into them rightly and they'll have had environment and net zero drummed into them. And these are people who do not want to hear companies say, well, you know, the thing about carbon, it's very difficult. Or, you know, we've got this wonderful thing over here. Just look at that, don't look at our main business. All that you can't bullshit your way through that stuff anymore. So I think a kind of pointing correctly and, and in pure business terms of the future means taking digital really seriously and putting your money where your mouth is, but also diversity in the environment. And with that, with that comment, Mark, about, you know, news outlets investing in journalism more, I mean, what happened, do you think, in the first place to let it slide? Was it complacency? Was it lack of money? Or? Well, I look, I mean, Mark, you, you know this industry extremely well as well. I'm sure you both do. I mean, it's, I think, honestly, part of the story is of... You know, and this is really tricky, uh, really tricky. Great, high-margin businesses 
yeah. which have made money honestly without too much effort for decades. I mean, there was a kind of like a hundred year period where the, the bottleneck that the, 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 um, the, the big TV companies everywhere and the newspapers had, if you were the, you know, the big um, Boston newspaper, Boston Globe, every um, uh, retailer in, in Boston and people, you know, with job ads and apartment ads, they came to you. You could charge top dollar for classified ads and all the rest of it. And the same would be true of the relatively small number of Boston, Boston affiliates, but local Boston stations. They all coined it. They all made a fortune. And these were great businesses, fabulous businesses. In some ways, they still are. I mean, the American networks still make big profits. I mean, they've been in decline essentially for 50 years, but they're still making big profits. Um, many local American newspapers actually are still profitable. If you look at the PowerPoint about what the future looks like and the trend lines, you know, you're going to make the sign of the cross. It does not look good and that they haven't got any solutions, many of them, about what they're going to do. Cable, US cable, is looking, I think, in a really dangerous place, but at the moment, they're still making vast amounts of money. When you're doing that, Finding the willpower and the kind of oomph um, in, in an organization to say, if we carry on like this, we're ultimately going to go bust. We have to change. We have to invest now. That is quite a heavy lift for most organizations. Yeah. It is. And I think I was lucky at the New York Times because essentially the, the key backdrop for me when I, I came to the Times in 2012, but the key event before I came, in a sense, was 2008-9, where the New York Times had a, essentially a liquidity crisis. It, it, uh, um, um, it, it's, um, its print advertising fell by about a third overnight in the financial crisis, around plus or minus 30% just went. And that was all cash, you know, apart from anything else, it was, by the way, about a margin of 95% as well. So incredibly high profit, but literally money coming in the door. And some of its debt some of its rot you know, uh, uh, rotating debt and the debt facilities it had came up and, and the company needed to renew this debt to carry on with its operations, particularly given that cash was not coming in. Suddenly the, the spigot of the, the faucet of cash had dried up as well and it couldn't find anyone to lend them the money. Now this, this as you know, this, can, this, this is you know, the symptoms of a potential cardiac arrest. And you know, I, I arrived two or three years after that had happened they hadn't forgotten. They 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 sort of had a, a like a, a health scare. They'd had a, this kind of warning, you know, they're, they're very much like a person who's had a you know, wow, <laughs> I got away with that, but I probably won't get away with it next time. Yeah, I better change. I better clean up my act. I better I better I better think about this deeply. And in a way, my appointment and what we did from 2012 onwards. And by the way, it was a team effort. Lots of people involved. I think it was in the spirit of. This is there is no BBC really in the in there's, there isn't this is a great American institution, and you know we've just sh shown that actually the Ming vase is pretty close to the edge of the table. And if somebody puts their elbow out, smash! That's that. Yeah, gone. Listen, I no, you, you went at the you know, NYT. You know you're credited with turning the company into a digital success story thanks to a. I say mainly a successful paywall strategy and it which attracted more than 5 million paying subscribers, yeah. which is phenomenal. And at the time you were hiring hundreds of journalists at the time when much of the rest of the industry faced deep cuts, something similar to what you, you were talking about earlier. Yeah. How, how important were and how are important subscriptions for the well, future? Do you think it's a panacea for news media? Well, look, I, 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 I mentioned this point already in this, in this conversation. Actually, I think the real fantasy is, is like profound engagement. Uh, to me, when I got, you know, I, I worked essentially in not-for-profit broadcasting, you know, quite a lot of journalism, quite an awful lot of administration and management and God knows what, but basically not worked in the commercial sector, not worked for a newspaper. And, you know, yeah, I'm not an idiot. I kind of went around and asked everyone I could, I could who would see me, what do you think? What should we do? I mean, I, and by the way, these weren't polite sort of, it was like, literally, I need to figure out what to do. Maybe you've got the answer. And everyone, pretty much everyone was focused on, you know, kind of chief executives and, and, and strategy people and the market and all that stuff. We're focused on monetization. They were focused on um, uh, what can you do with digital advertising um, yeah. to replace, essentially to replace print advertising and what can you do around subscription? And actually, I think the big thing we figured out is it's not really about that. There's no kind of magic. I mean, there's some there's some kind of clever stuff you can do, and we did it, and we tested it, and we got very smart at how you you get people to convert to subscriptions and how you retain them. So there's some stuff there, but 
It's not the heart of it. The heart of it is having a great product and great, you know, it's a great journalism and great apps and all the rest of all these things and put them in front of the public. So they fall in love with what you do. And they're in a, in, a, in a state of mind of thinking, actually, this is great. In fact, it's indispensable. Of course, I want to get a subscription. Yeah, so the yeah. real action is the inter interface with the audience and providing something of great value. And honestly, I would say it's like somebody makes shoes. You, you make really good shoes. You stick them in the window and you price them fairly and people go buy. Somebody buys a pair. They try them. They like them very comfortable. They tell their friends. The friends come. They buy them as well. I mean, this is the it's literally at the level of the quality and distinctness of the product the fact that the product is a lot better than stuff you get for free or for less money and then you know be, be straightforward about how you tell people it exists and try and be influential and the rest of it so it was a guess what i was which is why you hire journalists you know i mean instead yeah. of firing journalists to get the books to balance you say well that's mad and and there was a the, the person who i thought understood this completely was Reed Hastings, the guy, co-founder of Netflix. And I've been talking to Reed. I think I first met him in 2007 when I was director general of the BBC, and he was trying to persuade me not to launch the iPlayer, because he said, I'm going to do that, and my algorithm will always be better than yours, so why don't you just give me all your content, and I'll, I'll distribute it for you. You won't have to mess with this, all this digital complexity. You know, you know that. <laughs> I didn't, didn't take his advice there. But yeah. one of the things Reed understood was his business depended on actually having a stream of super high quality content. And he got it initially because Hollywood was silly and he, he struck very good deals for big packages of TV shows and films with the Hollywood studios. Somebody broke, I think Disney or somebody, I can't remember. One of the studios kind of said, oh, all right, we'll give you some because he was offering ready catch. So he started off with movies and, and, and basically old runs of TV, you know, kind of um, friends. You know. um, actually, he realized sooner or later the Studios are going to wake up. I'd better make the stuff myself. And he just threw, has thrown money at great new content. That's where the crown comes from and all those other shows. And that's the that's the correct idea, I think, is you want to be distinctive. You want to be the best. You've got to invest. And, and forget the print business model. And, you know, I always said the print, you know, it's like you hire journalists when advertising is good. And when there was a recession, you fire journalists so you can make nice fat profits even when there was a recession. And, and your, your shareholders and your owner will be very happy with you. That doesn't work when you're talking about a complete change in the entire industry. It just doesn't work. So along with the sort of digital successes that you've had and others have had, um, and with the sort of acceleration of the pandemic and how people have moved online, do you think we will see the end of print anytime soon? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we don't know. And I, I don't want it, you know. Um, mm. uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I personally like print newspapers and particularly print magazines, and and uh, so you know, but I'm a sixty-three year, three year old white guy who's obsessed with media, so of course I would. But but the the what happens is the economics of print probably go on deteriorating, and the you know if you think of it at the margin, the kind of marginal copy, you know, the marginal subscriber, uh, you know, the hard, the, the, you know, let's imagine the, the Times and it's some you know part of the southern united states and your 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 your, your costs are okay because you're you're piggybacking on a local newspaper that local newspaper goes bust uh uh suddenly suddenly you need to find someone to print it yourself and actually to pay for trucks yourself you can't just stick it on the other the trucks for the other newspaper you've got to find your own trucks and so they've got to deliver, deliver between half past five and seven o'clock in the morning so you can't give it to ups sort of thing you've got to do your own distribution the unit cost of that becomes expensive. And meanwhile, your own print advertising super high margin is declining. So profitability, the kind of, if you like, the kind of um, net cash sort of contribution margin from print begins to get squeezed towards break even. And there comes a point where you're actually having to spend money to print newspapers. Mm. And so why would you bother if you've managed to build your digital business into a, a business with really good operating margin and good, uh, uh, and good uh, really good profitability, and you've scaled it, so it's much bigger than your print business ever ever was. Why not just back that horse? So, so, yeah, the New York Times still has a million people nearly reading it in print market. And it's fantastic. And by the way, the the, the longer Times can keep those, and they're, they're very valued, traditional, mainly older, but but not all older, but significantly older. They're, they're going to live longer than any previous generation have lived. And I think for as long as the Times can serve them with sane economics, it should do that. Yeah. I sometimes speculate about whether in the end you can give them a bit like a kind of like a fancy coffee machine service. Eventually you can give them a home printer 
which is adapted. So um, you send them ink and paper once in a while, so they can actually print their own. I mean, so you know, if you want to do that, if you if you want the physical paper, you find a technology so somebody can keep it under the stairs, and you know, yeah. a bit like a goblin teas mate. You know, you're going to at seven o'clock in the morning, you wake up, <laughs> and there, there's your paper. I mean, uh, uh, because the idea of the old industrial, the old industrial model of a great big printing plant and a fleet of trucks and you know hundreds of tons of, print, of newsprint. I mean, it's, you know, just think, on the base of the environment, it is an insane way yeah. uh, I remember and, walking around the, the, the uh, Broxbourne uh, news's operation there, and it was just as far as the eye could see, it was print presses. Well, I mean, if you went to College Point here, uh, near LaGuardia Airport, which is where we put our printing, I mean, by the way, it's a complete, essentially automated digital, or almost all entirely automated digital process. It's an incredible, incredible process, and it's incredibly good. And by the way, we're now, the moment this is what happens in late stage um, industrial economics where essentially um, the times is pretty much printing every other newspaper that's printed in new york and that we are the home trucks mm. which is good with the other guys because our trucks will be going as long as anyone's probably in, in, in the western world i think but you know ultimately pretty much every newspaper that was printed in in in, in new york in what were originally probably a dozen newspaper printing plants Will be printed in that one plant and they'll all go on the same front yeah um, so it, it, but that, that, that's a good intelligent way of exploiting the fixed cost uh, resources you've got to to maintain profitability uh, for as long as you can but yeah. in the end it's a it's a fighting retreat and sooner or later the economics i, I believe and the modeling suggests sooner or later if you want me to bet about times i'd say mid 30s mid to late 2030s sort of thing 35 to 2040. So plenty more to come. And by the way, that means plenty of hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of free cash flow. And the key is to use the free cash flow from that as your internal investment bank. And use, that's the money you use to invest in your other business, which is the one that can grow and, and thrive. That's the I, model. I think, I think you, you also mentioned uh, a, a quote, uh, which is someone on the lines of, you know, the future's all going to be about boldness and, and being brave and younger audiences and truly embracing digital, as you said. And that sounds to me like wise words for any business in any industry. Yeah. Because, oh. And I think it's really easy for that to sound, particularly to, honestly, older people. And remember, many traditional executives are older people. And they are. Many of, many of us are older white guys who've grown up in a completely yeah. different world, honestly. I mean, you know, I started using a mobile phone probably in the early 80s on, like, you know, with a kind of massive battery of Newsnight, you know, kind of by-election coverage sort of thing. So, you know, we didn't grow up on stuff at all, really. Um, and, and to us, you know, all this stuff about younger audiences can sound like, oh God, you can, you're going to put disco music on everything. <laughs> it's not that. It's what great media organisations have always done. And it's not really even about making your audience on average younger. It's making sure you hold your demographics. You have to reinvent yourself. Just hold your demographics. If you don't, you know, with a service like Radio 2, for example, if you don't try quite hard so that the, the Radio 2 of 2021 probably sounds slightly more out there than the Radio 1 of, 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 of 1967, it's probably actually younger music, more edgy music and all the rest of it, and more kind of new music and distinctive music than BBC Radio 1 used to have. If you don't do that, the Radio 2 audience hasn't got younger probably got slightly older actually to stay where you are it's the old you know um uh, uh alice in wonderland you are through the looking glass you have to run very hard just to stay where you are yeah yeah so looking forward at the sort of future of media so you know in 20 years time looking back do you think how how uh, dramatic has the effect of the pandemic been on media what what's your sort of we, prediction we, we don't we don't know we don't know i mean uh, and so everything, every, everything one feels and thinks, and I'm, you know, people ask me this, and I'm you know, in board meetings, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean? Um, mm. um, well, um, I, I, I'm one of those people who thinks, and this is a complete platitude, everyone says it, but I think it's probably true, that the way digital works often is uh, financial crisis being the same. It's like, it's like a one way ratchet. You don't really go back. And there are some things that happen that actually slightly speed you up. Doesn't mean that you keep that speed forever, but you probably don't go back afterwards. And for example, yeah. over um, you know uh, my time at the New York Times, I would say that the story of print advertising is the the print advertising you lose in a recession 
only a small amount of that ever comes back. Mm. The, the, the marketing departments, in a sense, they, they, there's a new normal, which is established during, yeah. the, during, during the recession. And actually, by the time they come out, also internal incentives, you know, careers in marketing agencies and, and companies, you know, the, the, the marketing department wants to show its own bosses. It's thinking really hard about the future. And the more expert they get, the more they are keen to start saying declaratively, well, we don't even print anymore. That's old, old news. We, all we care about is social media. And I, I think every media company's heard that. And sometimes it's bullshit. And some, but actually, bullshit in this world really matters. And I think the same with subscriptions. The people who cancel uh, their subscription to a physical newspaper and but keep the digital subscription, for example, kind of find quite quickly that they don't miss the physical paper as, as, they, as much as they might. So I think you get this kind of one-way ratchet, and I suspect COVID's going to be like that, that we'll, that we'll have seen mm. a significant further habituation of audiences to, you know, um, uh, you know kind of distance, retail, um, um, takeout, ordering of food, uh, um, uh, digital um, news and, and entertainment consumption, the streaming services. And, and that's mm. it. And in terms of the workplace, I mean, I, I, I thought that, you know, um, um, in the, the inside the New York Times and, and frankly, a, another number of other in, institutions um, I've worked with, you know, if it was a scale of, you know, like um, one, we're going to go back to working exactly as we did before, and ten. It's going to be completely different. Nobody will ever set foot in an office ever again. It's all going to be distributed and remote. You know, there were some people in the in the in the um, in the Times who thought honestly, um, the Times would go back to one one or two. That people like being in a newsroom. They like working together. Actually, it's very cohesive culturally. It's practical. Bosses can keep an eye on their people. So we're going to go back. Other people said, "No, no, no, no! I'm, I'm moving to I'm moving to Minnesota now, uh, and I'm enrolling my kids in Minnesota. And then, by the way, they're really enjoying it. I can do everything I did from a, from a from a farmhouse in in Minnesota. I don't need to come back. And so, and, and by the way, I'm scared of of, of of variants, and I'm scared of 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 now going through, for example, New York public transport to get to work. I don't want to go to work. I don't feel safe going to work." And so there's this big distribution. I mean, this is done in surveys. I mean, you get some people, get, literally, you ask that question, one to 10, what do you think? And you get this distribution curve. I'm one of the people in the middle. I think it will change a lot. I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to change everything. So I'm probably at a kind of somewhere between a four and a six, you know, and I don't, I, who the hell knows how that works out. And I think that testing and learning and experimentation in kind of these last months. So let's try and, let's try and use volunteers to figure it out and, and figure out what's the point of an office. You know, when do we need to come together uh, so we know each other, so we, we can genuinely debate and discuss and, and get a real team spirit, particularly between different departments. And when, honestly, are you doing the kind of work in the office you could do more comfortably and easily, and by the way, more cheaply, in the comfort of your own home with it on a laptop? And there's plenty of that, you know. We, but we had a model of, you know, basically kind of a milking shed where you've got individuals uh, working in a big office on typewriters and then computers, you know, doing their little processing or whatever it is and honestly that you know you then erect barriers to try and keep the noise down and try and stop them distracting each other but what's the point of doing that in an office i mean where everything you're trying to do is to try and pretend that they're really on their own at home. <laughs> it's like yeah. and the activity is really just them on the computer it's it's futile and expensive to and there's lots of people you know consultancies and and many other kind of professional services have been experimenting with this and i think you know many many companies including the New York Times have, you know, I think engineering, software engineering, I think was probably 20% remote before COVID. Mm. That's because of scarcity. You, know, you you get the great software engineers where you can. And if the software engineer, if the kind of Android engineer wants to live in, on Lake, Lake Tahoe and does their work well, uh, and frankly, it's not necessarily, necessarily in this case, this, this imaginary case, the most social creatures anyway, kind of prefers not to be in the company with other people, except when they need to be, let them do it. And, the, and I mean, there's some very interesting effects of that. And one obvious one, which you may or may not be aware of, is um, something really scary is happening, which is essentially the very big um, Silicon Valley majors, Google, Facebook, and so on, are now happy to hire um, software engineers and data scientists pretty much anywhere in the world. Mm. That means that the economics and the pay of these categories of very scarce, very valuable people 
is normalizing up to Silicon Valley rates. Yeah. So you're competing in New York or frankly in Hull with Google and Facebook for, for compensation. Yeah. And it's like a single globalized market with some very, very big, very, very kind of well-heeled competitors snapping up the... So one of the big practical things is I think in 21, it's much harder, would be much harder for a... Um, like a media company in Europe or in America to do what we did in 2012, which is suddenly really kind of man up, man and woman up in 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 these areas. And we you know we I think probably double the number of engineers, quite apart from you know the newsroom. We were hiring engineers and data scientists and all this stuff. And actually, because it's the New York Times, it's New York, um, lots of actually lots of the engineers who who kind of like culture and the arts and kind of love New York as a city and got group of friends New York Times is a really nice thing to have on your on your CV so we were doing we were competing well that's getting a lot harder now it's getting a lot harder and Mark in, in, here we are 2021 and you're your great news for us on this call here that you're staying in the media world it seems that you're going to be um, or you are consulting with Axel Springer one of the biggest media companies in Europe so um, I believe you'll be moving to their supervisory board soon and no doubt yeah, that, I'm, 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 an I'm an advisor this year to the supervisory board but they're, they're planning to make me a member of that board um, right. in 22. Um, and presumably your you know track record on digital news products and subscription well, I mean, I, I, businesses. I know, Matthias Dirksner, the, the chief executive yeah. and now a very significant shareholder as well, um, is a friend of mine. Um, we've been um, kind of swapping notes uh, for many, many years. I'm a very big fan. I thought that um, when I looked around the world in 2012, who is really grasping them? Who's really doing this? Because I was looking for role models. I mean, it sounds silly. It, you can't, you know, arrive from, you know, as a kind of, in the end, a kind of English civil servant in the middle of what feels like a kind of far fight. Um, um, you're looking for someone you can say, well, who's, who, who do I want to emulate? Who's got some things that, that I, can, I can learn from? And I would say Matthias was probably more than almost anyone in world news, um, the one who I thought was doing a pretty good, pretty heroic task in, in turning his organization around and taking it seriously. And that, that's part, I think that's where our relationship began. It was very much me as, as the student as well, and, and, and him, him as the like the established master, um, uh, he's a financial journalist himself by by training and persuasion. That's how he got into into the business. But he he's been an executive for many years. I mean, early two thousand, he became chief executive of the Springer Group. So we're going to have fun there. Um, uh, by the way, someone who has the same admiration that you have for him, they have for you is uh, someone want to be remembered to you. Tony Hunter is the CEO, of course, of McClatchy. He yes. said he. He, he learned everything he knew, he said, from you. <laughs> oh, it's very kind. I mean, it's, I think it's much, really. I mean, you know, it, I think it's, I just think it's, and it's, I just think it's, you know, when the newspapers were being, you know, the kind of modern newspapers were being founded, some of them are older, I know, but, you know, if you think in, in, in both Britain and, 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 and the US of like, you know, kind of 1850 to 1900s, a period where, you know, the FT is, uh, is founded. The uh, the New York Times is is essentially refounded. Exists in the eighteen fifties. It's bought by in eighteen ninety five by Adolf Ox, who's the patriarch of the Ox Oxburger family, who still control the Times. Yes. Yeah. Um. It's it's high minded, but it's also pretty hard nosed. Um. These are hard nosed business people who want to make a profit, and they're thinking hard about how you apply quality and distinctiveness to a product which is going to attract, you know, the more better, more kind of Tony advertisers, and it's going to capture the imagination of the movers and shakers in your in your city. That's that's what yeah. happens. Or, you know, Financial Times, the, the financial world, you know, we are going to be the journal of record for the city of London. And that's, uh, and we're going to, you know, we're going to be the, the newspaper which understands economics and which can also therefore be influential with UK government and so on. That's how the FT begins. That, and that, that sort of spirit, which is, you know, work hard on, 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 on your positioning, Invest in content. Invest in really good journalists. Be serious. Don't don't try and get the cheap buck. This is the era where, in both sides of the Atlantic, there's a lot of tabloid stuff going on. And the, these guys are doing something different. They know they are, and they believe there's a good business to be had as well as really high-minded journalism. And I think, and they they were proven correct. And in a way, you know, my kind of the part I played in, in BBC News in, in the in the late 80s and, and through the 90s was was really part of that, you know, another version of that, which is simply, you know, make it good, make it distinctive, make people feel they won't get it unless they come to you. Yeah. And actually the audiences will come. 
an ancestry. I mean, you're now chairman of the largest genealogy company in the world. How did that come about? And what, what are you challenging? Yeah, I mean, I've, got, I, I've got um, friends at um, Blackstone, very big, uh, yeah. um, um, uh, one of the very biggest private equity houses. And we were kind of noodling around whether we could do something together. And, and they had an opportunity to um, become the, you know, the, the, the controlling um, owner of um, ancestry last summer. And uh, I've been stuck in. I mean, I'm having this experience, which many people are having, which is, um, I've never actually physically met any of the Blackstone people who are, are my partners in this. Um, I've not met physically any of the existing um, players at Ancestry, and I haven't met the chief executive, you know, I and the others have just appointed and who's just started at Ancestry. So it, this has all been done on Zoom. It, it, it's a kind of very, <laughs> actually, so far. Fingers crossed, going okay. But it's just a very, very strange moment where you know, Ancestry's main base is, is Utah, Salt Lake City, a suburb of Salt Lake City, uh, with a lot of uh, tech and all the rest of it in, in the Bay Area, in Northern California. I'm hoping to get there in early May for a board meeting where at least some of us are going to be physically in the room, albeit distanced and vaccinated and God knows what. <laughs> but that will be the first time I actually meet and kind of walk the floor and all the rest of it. So I've done town halls. I've met lots of different departments. As I say, we've appointed a new leader, a new full-time leader. Um, uh, I've appointed um, now three independent directors to the board. So I've been quite quite active in, in, in pushing forward, but it's all been done, you know, with this... This technology. <laughs> it, it's funny, it, it resonates with, I interviewed uh, Alma Latour at the Wall Street Journal uh, recently, and, and he said the same thing, that he's been in this job, and it's the best part of a year now, and he said he's only met 20% of the staff. <laughs> so anyway. Anyway, In my case, with Ancestry, it is literally zero. It is literally zero. Really? There's, you know, wow. a thousand people, literally wow. zero. So Mark, finally, um, thank you for your time today. It's been great. But I, I just wanted to mention, I read um, your advice for successful transformation in business. And the quote, I'm uh, going to quote back to you was, bring the new into the center of your work and move the established to the edge. Can you just expand on what you're meaning by that? So I, I think one of, the, I mean, one of the sad things is that really well-intentioned leaders, you know, the leadership cadre in a, in a particular company, can actually, in a sense, be very um, passionate about in innovation and about experimentation. But actually, the deal is they've got a core of existing operations, existing people, existing processes, and they see the experimentation and innovation happening at the periphery of, uh, if, if the thing was a circle, the experiments are happening not at the core, but at the edges, it's almost like you've got a big traditional factory and you build little sheds around it, which are going to do new stuff. And actually, it never happens. You never really get what's happening in the shed into the core. Yeah. And I think you, what you need to do is part of it, you absolutely, I think you do need, I think you do need the experiments which start at the edges. But I think the whole time you need to show to the organization that if what's working at the edge is better than what's working in the core, we're going to bend that bit of the core. And right. pull the people in the shed into the main factory, in fact, make them the, the, the people who run the main factory. And so the kind of tricks I did, and you, you'll know, so I, I, when I, one of the very first structural things I did at the New York Times was I, I set up a print products and services division. So there's a print team. And people thought I was mad. They say, it's the New York Times, it's a newspaper, you know, we make a newspaper. And I said, actually, I think the, co the company's got very deep muscle memory for that. And I think we can run our print operations with less than a fifth of the leadership. We've got a great guy, he's now the chief financial officer uh, of Roland Caputo. Let him run it. He'll handpick a small team, literally three or four executives, they'll run. And, they, and people said to me, no, but, but that's the main economics. I mean, you know, digital doesn't make any money. We've got more than a billion coming in from, from, uh, from print. We, we were giving it this, this most important the kind of crown jewels. I said, I, I trust the muscle memory. They know how to do it. They know how to do it. They're brilliant at it. Yeah. Just yeah. let them get on with it. And that means the rest of you are no longer working on print. You've got new jobs now. And it was actually, it sounds silly, but it was, that was quite, when people figured it out, there was quite a big aha moment, as in, because I felt honestly, a lot of people were hiding behind how incredibly complicated the existing operations are. We were all needed. It's, it's very difficult, you know. Um, and that's all, you know, it's kind of, you know, true sometimes. Generally, it's not true. And there's quite a bit of make work and, and departments whose life is spent arguing with each other about something. 
And if you get one person to do it, they know how to do it. You just press a button and boom, it happens. And, and you know, automated printing, but also in the end, you can simplify the way you sell print advertising and just, just, just accept it's great. It's going to last for years. You need to invest in it sometimes, by the way. But think of it as a separate puzzle and then say, actually, the thing we're going to worry about, or most of us, 90% of the time, is not the business we've got, but the business we're going to build. And that did work. Well, you know, that's great advice for anyone in any business, I believe, Marcel. Right. Listen, thank you so much for your time, James. I've got one final, final question for you. I know you, like myself, you've got a fondness for things red and Liverpool Football Club, maybe, and it's been a difficult season. Do you think we're going to get a Champions League space? Well, uh, so uh, honestly, the, the the real expert is my oldest son, who who you know, um, yes. Caleb. Um, um, uh, looking better, I would say, of, of late. <laughs> <laughs> um, incredible bad luck. I mean, it's not all bad luck, I don't know. Yeah. Incredible bad luck with injuries and the sort of, you know, yeah. the, the, this awful business um, of, you know, kind of, you know, what do you want? You know, do, do you want a strong, uh, you know, do you want a, a strong back line or do you want a strong midfield? Because you, you haven't got enough really good people to do both. So you know, <laughs> yeah. there isn't the right answer to that. Really. <laughs> and they've tried. So, so I would say, and as I, I'm not, I'm not really an expert. I do. I've, I've got a very strong kind of, you know, general emotional feel, but I'm not like you, a real, real expert. I think it's been an extremely bumpy season. Um, Klopp, I think, is, is, is so impressive. And, and in defeat and in, you know, with things slipping and sliding, still, I, I find him incredibly impressive. And again, a role model as a leader, I think, actually. Yeah. I, I hope, I hope top four. Yeah, I hope top four. But I don't, what do you think? Um, there's a possibility we might scrape through. I've, I've got, I'm worried about the, <laughs> the, um, the next European game, though, at, at Anfield. They're saying it's going to be difficult, a difficult game at Anfield, but there's no crowd, so that makes a big difference. And, and I, I do think, again, this is slightly sentimental, but I'm one of the people who think that of all, of all um, premiership teams, Liverpool really do get something from their crowd. And I've been there. I mean, not often, but I've been there a few times. And they get something from the crowd. Take that away, and I think it actually does take a few percent points. It is a twelfth man, mm. sure. Yeah. So, mm. anyway, Mark, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate you. what you've done here. So, thank you. It's and, a real uh, pleasure, but, but both of you. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Very interesting. Thank, thank you. you. We'll catch you again soon. Thank you very much. Hope you feel.